Gupta here. Every year I say the same thing that uh, there's absolutely no interest in knowing what the free papers are and this is actually the scientific aspect of the All India is the strength is its free papers. And uh, a presenter and his or her friend or dad or relative is here and it's a real shame. I'm Dr. Manyar, there's Dr. Manoj Mathur with us and Dr. Nan Kishore and Dr. Kamlesh. We are going to be judging you. In the event, it's possible, in the event that we know some of you, okay, it's going to be possible that I may know, say, Ms. Pahuja, I might have heard her, or somebody else I might know. Feel absolutely relaxed in the knowledge that it will make no difference in our marking, okay? We're going to be free, fair, and absolutely enjoy the presentation. Do not come here to compete. Come here on stage. Don't be tense. It is just a game. You happen to be a scientific presenter today. Enjoy this moment and you will not get this again. Not at this moment. So please enjoy this for you. Okay? Uh, Anybody wants a rescheduling of your uh, rescheduling of your talks? Any personal requests? Yes, sir. Tell me. One thirty. You have an instruction course. What's your number, sir? Contract one minute. Okay. With the permission of all the other contestants, can I take him first? Is it okay with everybody? We start with the cataract session. Okay. Uh, no, only one, only one exception. We're making only one exception. Uh, just to keep you informed, we judge you on the content, on the presentation, on your slides, and the originality. And there are no marks for judges' bias. Okay? Right. So, Dr. Uh, Rajendra Prasad, IA, sir. Terminal chop, new technique for full thickness nuclear segment in hard mature cataracts. Rajendra Prasad from New yeah, Delhi. Yeah. Yeah, it's there. Uh, we'll keep the blindness and severe visual impairment in children are needed for planning and evaluating preventive and curative services for children. It is estimated that one child goes blind in every five minutes, and the blind years in children is equivalent to 75 million blind years due to cataract in adults. Fortunately, 75% of childhood blindness are treatable and preventable, but children do not complain of, complain of defective vision and adjust to their poor eyesight because uh, by sitting near the blackboard, holding the book closure or squeezing the eye. Hence, screening becomes extremely important in prevention or treatment of childhood blindness. But what is the distinction between screening and a screening program? A screening is a process of acquiring significant data about a population, while a screening program is not just a process of diagnosing vision problems, but it uses the collected data to refer children with possible problems for further evaluation and treatment. Hence, difference being intervention, an essential component of a screening program. My aims and objective of this study is to prevail, know the prevalence of ocular morbidity in school-going children and to assess the role of school screening camps in identifying and treating children with ocular morbidity. This is a cross-sectional study done under Sarv Siksha Abhiyan and the primary and secondary school of Jalod, Sirohi, Pali, Jodhpur, Jaisalmer and Barmet district of Rajasthan are included in the study. The children age group is 6 to 14 years and duration of the study was one year. All children 6 to 14 years in school are examined and the uh, ocular morbidity are divided into refractive and restorismus congenital cataract process and other causes of childhood blindness. And the method of are the in the cases of refractive error, dynamic and cycloplegic refraction was done. If vision was not improved in follow-up of two months, then amblyopia management was done. In cases of restorismus, BSV was assessed, and if there is amblyopia, patching was done. If no amblyopia, surgery or ex exercise was advised. Total 16,168 school children were examined for ocular morbidity, in which 51% are boys and 48% as girls. Prevalence of ocular morbidity was 
5,104, that is 31.6 percent, and refractive error is 1664, that is 32.6 percent, is the major cause of ocular morbidity. These are the results showing the causes of ocular morbidity in which refractive error 32.6 percent, cataract 5.8 is 25.6, corneal opacity 3.3, and others is 22.2 percent. This is the graphical representation of the prevalence of ocular morbidity. The sex wise distribution overall prevalence of ocular morbidity was more among boys at 35.9 percent and compared to the girls. Refractive error constitutes the major cause of ocular morbidity. In boys, prevalence of cataract treatment, vitamin A deficiency, and dosage was greater than girls. Corneal opacity, congenital and allergy was almost equal in both the sexes. This is the sex wise distribution of ocular morbidity. Age wise distribution of ocular morbidity, morbidity was highest in among 12 to 14 years of age group. Refractive error increases significantly with age. Cataract was highest in 6 to 8 years of group. Squint was highest in 8 to 10 years. Vitamin A deficiency was almost equal in all age group children. This is the refractive error analysis. Total number was 1664, in which the unilateral myopia 39.8, hyperopia 217, astigmatism 152, and bilateral myopia 532, hyperopia 315, and astigmatism 96. Total number of embryopic children are 168. 162 in which isometropia is 20, 26 and NL isometropia is highest that is 106 and the we, out of 162 156 children were advised patching and they are followed at two weeks one month and three months at the follow up of six months there is 45.5 percent children improved to vision better than 6 by 12. This is the result of the assessment of the patching. The visual assessment who underwent cataract surgery the maximum number of cataract patients are between the 6 to 8 years, that is 34.3 percent. And the preoperative uncorrected visual activity ranges from 682, perception of eye, light, and IOL was implanted in all the eyes. 96.7 percent of eyes were presented for postoperative evaluation at one, at one week, and 69.4 at four weeks, and 47.5 at six months postoperatively. This is a visual assessment in patients who underwent cataract surgery. At one week, 41.1 percent children improved to better than 6 by 60. The outcome of strabismus surgery was total to 40 children were operated, out of which 128 were isotropic and 112 were exotropic. All the strabismus surgery or sophoria were achieved in 219 cases and with excellent cosmetic. After one month of surgery, gross binocular vision was attained in 39.3 percent of exotropes and 17.9 percent of the isotropes. The salient features of this program, it is the initiative of state government to identify the causes of ocular morbidity by low vision assessment care. Children were first screened by school teachers under guided protocols. All camps were conducted by optometrists with the help of training. Cost of surgery as spectacles, low vision implanted, and all camps related costs should be paid by Sarv Shiksha Abhiyan Rajasthan to ensure maximum utilization to and through transportation. Cost of children and their attendance should also be paid by SSA. Surgical patients were coming to the base hospital on their scheduled date, and all of them were operated for by pediatric ophthalmologists following the standard protocol, foldable hydrophobic I will implanted in all the children with cataract. Follow-up camps were organized after three months to assess the utilization of the initiative. So to conclude, the school screening camps are worthy for the children of government school for identifying preventable and treatable diseases. It is cost effective with a primary eye care model. Comprehensive approach is needed for prescribing glasses, treating embryopia, and advising orthoptic exercises. Comprehensive surgical approach is needed by pediatric ophthalmology to treat the variety of ocular alignment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the audience is not permitted question. No, you are here now. Your, your slide is ready. Come. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That will be all. Good morning, chairpersons, so, ladies and gentlemen. The paper which I am going to present is Terminal Chop New Technique for Full Thickness Nuclear Segmentation in Mature Heart Cataracts. We have no financial interest in the subject matter of this presentation. We all know that these mature heart cataracts are virtually all nucleus, and the nucleus is so hard that it's identical to the solid hard rocks. They are stronger in compression but weaker in their tensile strength, which means it's always difficult to crush, compress, trench, incise, or sculpt these hard nuclei deep at the center of the nucleus, which we all have been using with the current surgical technique. But it's a little easier to crack and break. The cracking and breaking of these hard nuclei is easier, like we do with the hard rocks. The cracking or splitting is still easier if the mechanical forces are used at the naturally weak and open edge of that hard object. 
The open edge and the naturally weak point of hard nucleus is its equator, which is very soft, thin, and narrow. So which can be exploited for cracking these hard nuclei. The current surgical technique, the mechanics of segmentation works at the center of the nucleus, which in any case like very hard, very thick, very bulky, and it's always difficult to segment these hard nuclei if you are working at the center of the nucleus. And quite often, whichever technique we use, quite often we are left with incomplete nuclear segmentation. And then what happens? We have to struggle. We have to use a lot of FICO forces, very high intensity FICO forces, and a lot of manipulation at the center of the nucleus, which is very close to the posterior capsule. And then we land up with the complications. So today I am going to describe a new surgical technique called terminal chop to achieve full thickness nuclear segmentation in this mature heart cataract. Terminal chop is about utilization of unique mechanical forces to initiate a full thickness nuclear crack at the weakest soft and thin equator. The crack simply traverses through the entire nucleus extending from the center to the equator on the other side and gives you a complete full thickness nuclear segmentation. The concept of the terminal chop is based on Segmenting these hard rock. With the same concept, we are going to segment the hard nucleus. What we need to do is we have to create a good central large See here in this video, like how we crack these hardest of hard cataract. Make a small groove at the center, penetrate into the nucleus superficially. You have to go towards the equator. Don't go deeper superficially within the equator, superficial layers of the nucleus towards the equator, and then draw. See the edge of the nucleus, hook it, and make a groove, and then do a lateral separation. So this, 100% of the cases, you'll get a complete cracking of the nucleus. We did a small study of 188 cases. All the cases underwent terminal chop, and uh, the control cases underwent Nagaharas and the vertical chopping. And we found that the full thickness nucleus segmentation was possible in all the cases where the cases underwent with the terminal chop. The amount of the FICO energy used was least with the terminal chop. The total time was least and the manipulation was leased, and the injury to the adjacent structure was leased. So to conclude, terminal chop is a very safe, simple, swift, highly efficient, least traumatic technique to break these hardest of heart cataract. 
Terminal chop ensures a complete nuclear segmentation, including the posterior plate from the equator to equator through the center in 100% of attempted cases. Thank you very much. Questions from the... Yeah. Uh, Dr. Prasad, uh, I feel that this uh, procedure is almost very, very similar to the woodcutter technique. Uh, similar to? Woodcutter technique. Uh, See, woodcutter technique is called as a... Uh, uh, it's it's some, something like peripheral chop. So I'll tell you the basic three differences. The first difference is the phaco probe is not penetrating deep into the nucleus, where you need to hold the nucleus at the center. In all other vertical chop, the peripheral chop and the woodcutter chop, your phaco probe is going deep into the center, and then your chopper is going at the periphery. Okay, so what happens when you are bringing the chopper to the phaco probe, the nucleus starts moving, rotating. And in 70, 75% of the cases, you'll not get the cracking. But here, why you're not getting cracking? Because these two instruments are not at the same plane and not at the same depth. So what this terminal chop does is, your phaco probe is going superficially towards the equator, and the chopper is at the equator. Though both the instruments are at the same plane and at the same depth, then only you get the cracking. So this is what happens if you're cracking a hard rock. You have to have a, both the instruments There's at the same the, plane to crack. The question here is, uh, for your brown cataracts, how large is your excess? Uh, as I explained, sir, 5.5 uh, millimeters is sufficient. Okay, that's one. Uh, sir, the woodcutter technique uses the phacoemulsification power to crack. Yeah. Whereas in all these, it's the mechanical, it's the mechanical movement power. that cracks. So, you know... Woodcutter is the only technique where you continue to use FACO while you are cracking. In all others, you are in position two, and the hand is using it. All these techniques, Next. they work Thanks. very well in the moderately hard cataract. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Natasha. Natasha, before you start, uh, this is uh, after, uh, and you can load yours here. Later, later. Sit down now. I'm just giving you the order. Can you start, sir? Natasha, start. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so today we are going to be looking at keratoconus with a slightly different mm -hmm. perspective. So what is the profound impression that we get when we look at this? This shows that the housekeeping mechanism is out of order. That means the cleaning mechanism is out of order. Let's bring this analogy to our cell biology or the clinics. What happens is the housekeeping mechanism that happens in the body is maintained by autophagy. So what it essentially does is an autophagosome is formed which takes away the misfolded proteins and takes it to the lysosomes. This is how the cleaning mechanism in the body happens. So now we have the idea or the concept of autophagy. We wanted to see how this can be applied. Now autophagy has been used in the, has been established in degenerative diseases in the body itself and it has won a Nobel Prize last year. We wanted to see if this principle can be used or this principle is applicable in keratoconus. Now we know the causes for keratoconus, the established causes are the genetic factors. The environmental factors have a profound effect, most of which is by the oxidative stress. So what is oxidative stress doing with autophagy? Well, the initial response for oxidative stress after oxidative stress is initiation of autophagy. Now, having understood this concept, we wanted to create a cell model to understand if this can be applicable in keratoconus. So if uh, oxidative stress or autophagy, is it responsible in pathobiology or pathophysiology of keratoconus? To understand this, we created this oxidative stress in cell models simply by inducing hyperoxia. So hyperoxia causes oxidative stress. Now to prove this concept, what we did was these cell lines, um, they were cultured under hyperoxi hyperoxia and these cell lines underwent gene expression analysis to understand the uh, expression. They also underwent uh, Western blot to understand the proteins flow cytometry to understand inflammation and fluorescein imaging to understand the morphology of cells. Now having understood the entire panel, uh, uh, area of analysis, what we found was that if there is oxidative stress, there is increased reactive oxygen species. What it does is 
it alters the autophagy mechanism. Basically, the LC3 and LAMP1 are the autophagy markers and it is altering the autophagy mechanism. Having established that, we wanted to validate in, in Western blot. So Western blot also shows that autophagy is also altered when there is oxidative stress. It is blocked. Importantly, we saw this in terms of morphology. So the green bodies that we see here are autophagosomes. Again, showing that there is increased oxidative stress, showing autophagosomes, showing defective autophagy. Now, if there is increased, um, if there is altered autophagy, we wanted to see if this holds true from the cell to the clinic in patients as well. So what we essentially did in patients, in keratoconus patients, is that we collected the epithelium from the center of the cornea and the periphery, the apparently non-ectatic area of the, of the same patient or the same eye, stored it in a biorepository, went back to a biorepository and analyzed these samples. We had a very strict exclusion criteria. Essentially, the same story unfolds in patients' epithelium of keratoconus as well. So what are we trying to say here is, if in the area of the cone, there is decreased expression of the autophagy markers, that is LC3 and LAMP1. So what are we trying to say? That the disease in keratoconus is absolutely localized and the cleaning mechanism from the cone is absolutely vanished. So what happens in the non-ectatic area? Apparently, it's absolutely normal as compared to the controls like the PRK patients. So we have established that in keratoconus patients, there is altered autophagy. Now, is this a possible mechanism for uh, the pathogenesis of keratoconus? We wanted to see if there are therapeutic targets that can alter this mechanism. Now, understanding the entire pathway of autophagy, we wanted to see if we can block this somehow. So there are regulators. Now, commercially available regulator is chloroquine. So what we did on cell lines is that the oxidative stress that was induced, we treated this with chloroquine and we found that autophagy became optimal or it induced autophagy. So essentially what are we trying to say by this? There are environmental factors. What they do is essentially increase the reactive oxygen species on the ocular surface. This causes altered cells accumulation of these altered cells and if we do not remove them, if the autophagy is altered, this is going to increase inflammation, increase metalloproteinases. If they increase, they are obviously going to cause an effect on the collagen and matrix degradation. This explains why there is progressive ectasia in patients of keratoconus. Are there specific drug targets? That is what we are trying to study now. So to conclude, autophagy is an important cell survival mechanism which we have established. We have understood that oxidative stress is a pathway which is deregulating autophagy. For the first time, we are showing this in keratoconus as a possible patho uh, uh, pathogenesis mechanism. What is even more important is that you don't need to cross-link every patient. If this hypothesis comes true, you just need to give them topical drops. So what we already know is that there are mechanisms uh, in body which are altering uh, autophagy. What this study adds is for the first time we are showing autophagy and quantifying it and there are specific drug targets that can probably um, alter autophagy. Uh, we are trying to establish kits which will help us detect autophagy properly. Thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. May I start? No, they, they have loaded it on both, both, both the laptops. Actually, they don't have it either. Okay. So maybe they can add their own uh, laptop here. Put, put, aapka laptop hai, wo add kar Rekha Gyanchan here? No. Oh. Yeah, okay. 
very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, the topic of my paper is effect of ocular torsion on the followability of the ISNT rule by the retinal nerve fiber layer using SD OCT. I have no financial disclosures. Now we all know that optical coherence tomography or OCT has been widely used for glaucoma diagnosis as it allows objective measurement of the optic nerve head in the RNFL as well as the macular thickness parameters. Spectral domain OCT or SD OCT is a further refinement of this technique which allows imaging with a faster scan rate and at a higher resolution. Now we also know that the neuroretinal lymph rim follows a typical configuration called the ISNT rule wherein the inferior rim is thicker than the superior which in turn is thicker than the nasal and the temporal. Now this has been attributed to the inferior position of the fovea and it is violated in glaucoma. This foveal angle is the angle that is formed between a horizontal line extending from the optic disc center and the line joining the center of the disc to the fovea. A lower position of the fovea is denoted by a larger disc foveal angle and vice versa. Uh, the effect of RNFL change with foveal position and head tilt has been previously described. However, there are no studies on the followability of the ISNT rule based on the location of the fovea, which was the purpose of our study. So our study purpose was to report the effect of ocular torsion on the followability of the ISNT rule on the RNFL using the SDOCT in normal eyes. Ours was a prospective cross-sectional study which included 64 eyes of 64 patients who had come uh, to, for a routine eye examination at the outpatient department. One eye from each normal subject was randomly selected with the help of a random number table. Our inclusion criteria was age more than 18 years, best corrective visual acuity 20 by 40 or better, refractive error within plus or minus uh, 5 diopter sphere and plus or minus 3 diopter cylinder and a willingness to participate in the study. Exclusion criteria were media opacities preventing imaging, any intraocular surgeries in the past 6 months, tilted discs, disc hemorrhages or uh, extensive peripapillary atrophy, any retinal or neurological disease as well as glaucoma, uh, resulted in exclusion and those who had a poor scan quality uh, were also excluded. The RNFL imaging was done on the spectralis OCT with dilated pupils and special care was taken to avoid inadvertent head tilts. The ISNT rule was considered violated only if the difference between the quadrants was more than 10 microns. The dysphobial angle was calculated from the 30 degree infrared image by a method that has been described by us previously and published in JAPOS. So here we had used the image J software to calculate the dysphobial angle. The demographics the SDOC and the STOCT RNFL parameters were compared using independent sample t-test or the Mann-Whitney test. We used the Pearson's correlation to find the correlation between the dysphobial angle and the inferior superior RNFL quadrant thickness difference. Chi-square test was used to find differences between uh, the ISNT followability within the two groups. Multiple logistic regression analysis was done to find the predictors for ISNT rule followability. All these analysis were performed with uh, STATA 12.1 and a p-value of less than 0.05 was considered statistically significant. Our main outcome measure was proportion of eyes following the ISNT rule for the RNFL amongst the two groups. That is one group with dysphobial angle more than 6 degrees and the other with the dysphobial angle less than 6 degrees. So th the, this is the patient demographics and the RNFL parameter results. The mean age in our population was 40 plus or minus 4.8 years and the inferior superior RNFL thickness difference ranged from minus 14 to plus 26 microns. So this is a 30 degree infrared image from the RNFL printout which shows that the dysphobial angle was 2.9 degrees and the ISNT rule was not followed. Another similar image showing that the dysphobial angle was 13.2 degrees and the ISNT rule on the RNFL being followed. Uh, this particular table shows that in the group, in the subgroup where the dysphobial angle was less than 6 degrees, 62.5% uh, of the patients, they followed the ISNT rule, whereas in the subgroup where the dysphobial angle was more than 6 degrees, this number rose to 87.5%. Now, and this was statistically significant. There was moderate correlation between the dysphobial angle and the inferior superior RNFL thickness difference. The mean vertical optics, optic disc diameter as measured on the software that is present on the OCT itself was 1.52. The followability of ISNT rule was predicted by the dysphobial angle but not by the age, spherical equivalent, gender or the vertical optic disc diameter. None of the eyes interestingly with a dysphobial angle of less than 3 degrees followed the ISNT rule on the RNFL. So this is a prediction graph using linear regression analysis to predict the inferior superior RNFL thickness difference from the dysphobial angle. Uh, moving on to the discussion, our study reconfirms the importance of foveal uh, position in the RNFL measurement. The inferior superior RNFL thickness different, difference was definitely more in patients who had a greater dysphobial angle. Uh, now our study is also supported by this particular study by Valverde, Megias et al, wherein they found out that displacing, manually displacing the fovea superiorly resulted in the thinning of the inferior RNFL and vice versa. 
The limitations of our study include a young age. Uh, it had only Indian eyes. There were no participants who had a large optic disc size. And obviously, the limits of refractive error were narrow. However, all these limitations are likely to affect the RNFL measurement in all the quadrants equally and therefore may not have affected the followability of the ISNT rule per se. To conclude, the followability of the ISNT rule on the RNFL is definitely affected by the foveal position or the disfoveal angle, and this relative position of the fovea should be kept in mind uh, while seeing printouts where RNFL uh, do not follow the ISNT rule per se. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you. Uh, any questions, sir? Uh, Dr. Parag Dave is done, and um, Dr. Mayuri Kamar is here. Hold on, sit, 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 sit. Right now we have, I think, Dr. Sushma. Sushma. So, Mayuri, what you could do is you could just prepare your things here. Huh? Sushma, go ahead, please. Good afternoon. The title of my paper is Assessment of Residual. L hey, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I want the timer set, please. This is at five. That's not fair. Okay, 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 the plus one. Fair enough. Sorry. Hmm. The title of my paper is Assessment of Residual Effects Due to Topical Medication on Cornea Stiffness in Primary Open Angle Glaucoma. Now, all the current tonometers that we have measure the intraocular pressure through cornea. So, it is important to understand the properties of cornea in order to have an accurate measurement. So, if you look at the stress versus strain relationship in a tissue depends on the young modulus and it's quite linear but it is quite different for the soft tissue like cornea so as you give a stress to the cornea there is certain amount of stiffening that happens and as you release the stress from the cornea there is some amount of softening that happens now there is a gap between the two so there is a lag which is called viscoelasticity and that is what we are looking at in to, uh, after having this background, the aim of the study was to study the effect of topical medication in POAG eyes on corneal stiffness with airpop applanation data using two models, that is viscoelastic model and infinite, inverse finite element model. Now, uh, we took 76 POAG eyes on glaucoma medications and 39 normal eyes which were analyzed using Corvus ST. Patients were got grouped into those who were using beta blockers alone, prostaglandins alone and a combination therapy and a viscoelastic model was applied to the corneal deformation which can give us the quantification of corneal stiffness, extraocular tissue stiffness and viscosity. These parameters were then analyzed using multivariate analysis of covariance and IOP and PCT were used as covariates. So all patients underwent Corvus ST and Pentacam and uh, there were three groups, beta blockers, prostaglandins only and a combination. The patients who had uncontrolled intraocular pressure had any history of ocular surgery and were having any corneal ectatic disorders that could affect the stiffness were excluded and patients with other anti-glaucoma medications were also excluded. Now, uh, to look at the analytical uh, biomechanic model, if you look at the cornea and when there is an air pop applied, there is an indentation that happens. Now, when the cornea turns back, when the stress is removed, it turns back to its normal position, but not exactly to the normal position. There is some amount of lag. And since the cornea is attached at the limbus with the globe, some amount of it is contributed by globe as well. So when we get the deformation by the machine, we get the total deformation. And we have to separate corneal de deformation from the globe deformation in order to understand corneal stiffness. So we used a model where the cornea was considered as a spring model that tells us about the corneal stiffness. And the uh, extraocular tissue was considered as a spring and dash pot model so that both the components could be separated. To make it simple, uh, when we look at the glaucoma patient and we take the measurement through Corvus ST, this is what you get, that is total in, in uh, deformation. And then we get the calculated deformations for cornea, extraocular tissue and the total. Now, when we have all these parameters plus the amount of air puff wash which is applied and we put this equation, that simply gives us the corneal stiffness. So, this is what was used to, uh, uh, to have the proof of concept. We measured the deformation amplitude which is directly given by the machine. So, when we put, um, plotted the graphs of total deformation, this is what we got amongst all groups. See, all the curves are almost overlapping. So when we took the cornea component alone, if you look at, you can start seeing the differences among as the curves. And uh, again, the extraocular tissue also had more or less the overlap.
So um, uh, to look at the corneal stiffness data, now these are the results. If you look at the demographics, that clearly tells you, tells you that the age, corneal thickness and intraocular pressures were not very different across the groups. So that would not have affected the corneal stiffness. Now if you look at the KC values, now KC is the corneal stiffness, you can find there is a clear cut difference between the normal and the beta blocker group and the p-value was less than 0.05%. That was significant. And also there was a difference between the mu g, that is the globe is viscosity in the normal and the prostaglandin group. Now this was quite interesting to find and we did not expect this, so we wanted to validate it with the inverse FE model. So what we did was that we got a structural data as well. Now this was the functional data by looking at how much deformation you get and the pentacam of these patients gave us the structural data. So with each cornea we could make a model where we could uh, understand that how much deformation would, would happen with a particular amount of stress, say from uh, pressures of 0 to almost 60. So when we combine this structural and functional data, for each cornea we could get a curve which could tell us that how the uh, cornea would respond to that amount of stress. And when we use this in this particular group of patients, we found the similar uh, results. That means uh, if you look at the beta blocker uh, and the combination therapy eyes had more stiffness as compared to the normal and prostaglandin eyes. So the conclusions that were drawn was there is some amount of residual effect on the corneal stiffness and the extraocular viscosity in glaucoma patients even after control of intraocular pressure. And anti-glaucoma medications do have their effect on the corneal viscoelasticity. Beta blockers found to have increased the corneal thick stiffness on long-term usage. Hence the intraocular me pressure measurements of glaucoma patient may be influenced by the effect of drugs as well. However, mechanism of such effect is yet unknown and we need to have longitudinal studies for that. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions here from the chair? Okay. I'm going to present my study on abnormal anatomical variation in pediatric eyes with shorter axial length. We know that the microphthalmic eyes with the congenital cataract are predisposed to develop glaucoma following cataract surgery. In our previous study, we found out that the incidence was 30.9% at the end of four years follow-up. However, the abnormalities leading to the glaucoma development in these eyes has not been known. So keeping this in mind, we undertook a study to identify morphological difference using UBM in a fake eyes of infants operated under the age of one year with shorter axial length less than 17 millimeter compared to the fake eyes of the infants with the normal axial length. This was a prospective observational comparative case series following congenital cataract surgery. Our study has 35 eyes with the microphthalmos. They were compared with the 25 eyes without microphthalmos. All infants were operated under the age of one year by a single surgeon using standardized technique and the eyes were kept a fake -ic. The preoperative intraocular pressure was less than 18 millimeter of mercury with or without microcornea and any coexisting ocular or systemic anomaly or comorbidity were excluded from the study. The patients were regularly followed up and detailed examination was done. The UA was done and UBM was done at three months of uh, post-op follow-up using AVSOC 1 uh, using 50 and 25 megahertz probe as per our requirement. The outcome measures were anatomical measurement and morphological changes of the anterior and posterior chamber structures. This is how we did the anatomical measurements. Uh, the special software was also available to find out the TISA as well. And the uh, ciliary, uh, sulcus ciliaris is being concentrated upon by using this. This is the demographic profile of our two groups and they were identical except the uh, axial length and this is by def, uh, study design. The microphthalmic eyes incidence of rise in intraocular pressure was 31.4% at the end of five years. And this table is showing you the UBM quantitative parameters of both the groups. And from these, it is evident that the sulcus ciliaris, that is iris ciliary process distance, and the internal angle width was significantly less in the microphthalmic eyes. This can be explained by the short actual length of microphthalmic eye. This is an example of the non-microphthalmic eyes with the normal intraocular pressure. You can see the 
UBM picture showing you normal axial uh, interchamber depth, good iris uh, uh, structure, open angles, iris ciliary processes, and good sulcus ciliaries. Now, abnormal morphological features like ciliary body insertion posted to the iris surface, elongated ciliary processes, high iris insertion, iris hypoplasia, and flat pars placata were significantly more in the microsthalmic eyes compared to the controls. The elongated ciliary processes are shown here. They are like finger-like projection oriented parallel to the posterior surface of iris and appear to be aberrantly inserted to the posterior surface of the iris. And surprisingly, none of the normal eyes had this elongated ciliary process, while in microphthalmic eyes, which develop high intraocular pressure, the incidence was 81.8%. Ciliary body insertion on the posterior surface of the iris is shown in this figure, and it was seen in the eight eyes of the microphthalmas who develop high intraocular pressure. Similarly, high iris insertion was also significantly more in the microphthalmic eyes with the high intraocular pressure. You see the hypoplasia of the iris, and it was almost in all the microphthalmic eyes, and these rudimentary iris were significantly more in the eyes with the high intraocular pressure. So the flat pars placata was seen in the microphthalmics as well as non-microphthalmic eyes, but the incidence was high with the high intraocular pressure. This table is to summarize microphthalmic eyes with the raised intraocular pressure compared with the normal intraocular pressure. And from this, it is evident that if there is alter or abnormal morphology uh, is there, then the child is at a high risk of developing rise in intraocular pressure. The review of the literature showed us only one article saying that the presence of elongated ciliary processes in aphakic eyes with the congenital glaucoma can be there, and it is because of the stretching mechanism. But our eyes were short eyes and aphakic, so stretching mechanism is not possible. Abnormalities of ciliary body has been described in eyes with the congenital glaucoma with longer axial length. Our eyes were shorter axial length. Other abnormalities are not described so far in the literature. So to conclude, ciliary body developmental abnormalities such as elongated processes, abnormal insertion of iris, ciliary body, these all are more common with the microphthalmic eyes with congenital cataract, and these eyes are more susceptible to develop rise in IOP after cataract surgery. The limitation is it is difficult to explain delayed development of glaucoma in spite of congenital anomaly. And how we can imply the knowledge? If we have a preoperative information, we can plan the treatment option accordingly. We defer the sulcus fixated secondary IOL when there is a no sulcus or fused sulcus. And we can counsel the parent regarding the lifetime follow-up and bad prognosis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? I have no commercial interest, but I am the uh, honorary technical advisor to the Government of India's task force, and I'm also the unpaid PI for a DBT trial. The problem statement that we saw it about 10 years ago was the fact that there are more than 35 lakh preterm babies born every year in India with less than 100 ROP specialists, almost none in the rural areas. What we started was the first rural telemedicine ROP program where we used an expensive, bulky, and imported camera to take it into the NICUs. We trained non-doctors to take these pictures, upload them on a telemedicine platform, and have these images read on the smartphones of remote ROP specialists. What started off as three hospitals is currently 107 through a public-private partnership with the government. We're almost close to our one lakh baby, and we've treated almost 1,800 preterm babies in the rural area. The Supreme Court in 2015 said that ROP screening is now essential newborn care, paving the way, therefore, for an all-India expansion. But what, then, is the biggest barrier for this expansion? It's obviously the cost of this camera, which is 85 lakh, and hence the need for this invention. The aim of this free paper is to present to you this invention, compare it with the gold standard, and study its economic benefit in the community. This is a prestigious DBT trial with industry partners Forus, technology partner IIT Chennai, and us as the clinical validators. The prototype really began five years ago, and as we improved in the form and the feel, the field of vision and the source of illumination, 
the first device that came out in the third quarter of 2014, you can see its more bulkier predecessor here on the left. We were for the first time able to get wide field images and we were excited, but the quality was not good enough. So we went back to the drawing board, improved the hardware and the software. We established its safety in 140 babies and obtained the ethics committee approval. The more current version, which is now in market for the past four or five months, is much sleeker, more portable, but more importantly, produces better quality images all the way up to the ora serrata with more real life retinal vascular details in the edge. The current version sits in a briefcase and now can be ported on a two-wheeler, let alone hand carry on a flight. This is not reverse engineering. We have two international patents, one for the illumination source and one for the liquid lens that has been used for the first time. Even the images produced by this camera, the Neo, is larger than that of the red cam, as you can see from the polygon. Superior and inferior retinal arcs are more than the standard gold standard. It's also less bulky, it's lighter, and it's cheaper, currently priced between 12 and 15 lakhs and expected to be less than a million rupees. The images look different, so if we had to compare them, we had to mask them, so we cropped them to resemble each other and gave it to two ROP specialists. One of them is my co-author, Professor Dogra from PGI. And the outcome was tested in over a thousand babies over a six month period. The demographics are nothing special, so I'll pass on that. But the images you can see are special. The top panel is from the new camera. It's more red-like. You see a very subtle stage two in zone three, and that's on the gold standard. The immature retina picked up on the Neo and the gold standard. Mature retina, which means that the blood vessels have reached the edge on the Neo and the gold standard. These are uncropped images of a baby that require treatment, stage three with zone two, with plus disease. The current limitations of the device are the fact we've not been able to master the midwitch's focus. We've not tested it on babies older than three months. And this has been uniformly tested on Indian babies alone. Whereas the sensitivity has remained high, the specificity is something that we were able to improve from 40 to the high 70s by reducing the edge artifact. But the true benefit of a device comes when it benefits the community. So for this, we did a cost-benefit analysis. We were helped by Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, that very, did a very detailed costing on us, look at all our recurrent and opportunity costs. Let me summarize that. To set up a new telemedicine program of ROP with the, the new device, it will be just one-fifth the current cost. And to keep it running, it will just be half. The benefit to the patient means that screening can now be six times cheaper compared to the current model. And for the fundraising organization who's paying for it, the recurrent cost can be five times cheaper. With wide field imaging currently becoming the new gold standard for ROP screening, and with Government of India's new national guidelines suggesting that RETCAM imaging or retinal imaging is a viable alternative, and with hundreds of neonatal intensive units mushrooming in the rural areas, it's probably time for us to replace a bulky, expensive, and imported camera with a made in India portable version that's probably quite robust. We have prevented about 400 crores of blindness in the past 10 years in the Kidra program. This would have been more than 2,000 crores had we used the NEO. If we extrapolate that to nine states with the problem, this would be 700 crores using the current model, upwards of 3,500 if we use the NEO. But numbers are for politicians. For clinicians like you and me, it's the baby that counts. So this is baby Sanvi, six years ago, detected with severe ROP with the red cam treated successfully, has now vision to see her preterm brother also with a severe disease, but this time detected on the Neo. Maybe it's time for us to allow the miracle to repeat itself. A small salute for those who have been part of this journey. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vineka. Questions, sir? It's available since October 2016. Uh, it's uh, formally approved by DBT. Uh, it's marketed by Forus. Uh, it costs currently 12 to 15 lakhs. In fact, they have a booth here. Uh, they are, they, it's up for display as well. About five uh, hospitals have bought it in India. Demography and influence on postmortem cold storage and corneal endothelium, a HCRP-based study. 
cornea retrieval is changing from voluntary to HCRP. We get more of optical transplants with HCRP corneas. To retrieve more corneas from HCRP, we can target the cadavers stored in the cold storage at the mortuary. So this is a mortuary-based study, the demography of the eye donors. Basically, we are looking at the endothelial parameters of the donors who are preserved in cold storage versus the ones which are not preserved and comparing the utilization in both the groups. So the HCRP was carried out in a large government hospital. Uh, adequately counts, uh, trained counselors were there. All standard guidelines were uh, followed. With po It was a monitored program. There were two groups in this study. The first group was the way the donors were refrigerated. And uh, no, the first group, uh, the, we had the non-refrigerated uh, donors where we could retrieve the cornea within six to eight hours of death. In the second group, these donors we were not able to retrieve because of legal issues and we had to preserve these donors within six hours of death and a cold storage at four to eight degrees centigrade and the eyes were collected within 15 hours of death. The eye donation counselors were trained to monitor the cold storage temperature. Consent was taken from the police. Corneas were stored in MK or Cornizol. Final grading was done. The first 30 cases of the cold storage group, the rim was cultured to make sure of the contamination part of it. So 373 cases we analyzed. In that, 62.47 way of the cold storage and 37.53 way of the non-cold storage group. Age group was similar in both the groups of 37.8 years. And uh, cause of death was similar in both the groups, hanging, accidents, poisonings. And uh, we could record the specular microscope in the cold storage preserved donors was much higher than the non-cold storage uh, preserves, 67% compared to 42%. And even the endothelial count was more than 2,700 in 62% of the cold storage group compared to the non-cold storage group. And hexagonal cells were excellent in the cold storage group of 83% compared to 78% of the non-cold storage group. Utilization of the donors stored in cold storage was much higher of 83% compared to 70%. And optical transplants were done in 65% of the corneas collected from the cold storage group compared to 35% of the non-cold storage group. Reasons for not utilization were sepsis and poor quality tissue and those exceeding the enucleation time. So uh, the demography was similar in both the groups and uh, the cause of death also was similar, like hanging was the most common cause. Younger donors were seen in the refrigerated uh, cases. In the cold storage group, we had death to enucleation of less than 10 hours death to pre preservation of 13 hours. In the non-cold storage group, it was 7.9 hours, and death to preservation was 10.57. Rim culture showed no growth, and we could record the specular count in 67% of the cold storage compared to 42% of non-cold storage. Endothelial density was more than 2,700 in 62% of the cold storage compared to 35%. Hexagonal was 59% compared to 39%. Utilization was 83% compared to 43% of the non-cold storage group. Optical graphs were 65% opticals compared to 35 of the non-cold storage group. There was a similar study done by Tendon et al. Their utilization was little less than ours. So ultimately, I would like to conclude saying that targeting the cadavers in the cold storage, we get a larger donor pool, younger corneas, excellent tissue quality, additional factor, time factor like for medical legal cases and donor motivation will help us this method. Thank you. Very good afternoon to all of you. I'll be talking about outcomes of intravenous methylprednisolone pulse therapy and immunomodulation in thyroid eye disease. I have no financial disclosures. 
Thyroidite disease is a progressive disorder caused by autoimmune mechanism directed towards orbital antigens, particularly the extraocular muscles and orbital fat, causing fibroblast proliferation, increased glycosaminoglycans, and release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Oral intravenous steroids have been the mainstay of treatment in the described literature. The natural history of thyroid eye disease suggests that there is an active phase which eventually dies out to become inactive after few months to years, causing fibrosis and complications. Therefore, we need to intervene at the active phase of the disease to prevent fibrosis. We aim to study the outcomes of intravenous methylprednisolone pulse therapy and immunomodulation combined in thyroid eye disease. It's a retrospective non-comparative consecutive interventional case series with 60 eyes from 38 patients with active thyroid eye disease from a single center from uh, January 2013 to 2016. A complete clinical evaluation was done including visual acuity, color vision, extraocular muscle movements, diplopia charting and Hertel's exophthalmometry. Every patient underwent a CT scan. A 9-point clinical activity score was used to grade the patients into active or inactive. Every patient scoring more than 3 on a clinical activity score was graded as active and amenable to treatment. We started with a loading dose of 500 mg of IVMP over 3 consecutive days, followed by 3 weekly pulses of 500 mg of IVMP each up to a total of 6 pulses. Oral azathioprine or mycophenolate morphetal was started after third pulse of IVMP in cases of suboptimal response and continued for at least six months. The mean age of the patients were 47.1 years with a standard deviation of 9.6 ranging from 27 to 70 years. Most of the patients were in the age group of 40 to 60 years and a mean follow-up of 6.2 months is available. 61% of the patients were male. 53% of the patients were hyperthyroid, 29% euthyroid, and 18% hypothyroid. Out of 39 eyes having exophthalmos, 59% improved, and a mean improvement in exophthalmos was 2.7 millimeters. This is a 39-year-old lady with unilateral exophthalmos who improved after six months of treatment on both immunomodulation and IVMP. He is a 50-year-old male with bilateral exophthalmos who improved after 8 months of treatment. Out of 25 patients having diplopia, 60% of the patients improved and only 10 eyes required prisms or extraocular muscle surgery for residual diplopia. She is a 38-year-old female with right eye superior gaze restriction and diplopia in superior gaze. She improved after 6 months of treatment. This is the pre and post CT scan, uh, post treatment CT scan of the patient. Uh, the caliber of inferior rectus muscle, as we can see, has reduced to normal after treatment. He is a 50 year old male with right eye inferior restriction. He had diplopia while reading and he improved completely with complete remission of diplopia after six months of treatment. 89% of the patients had complete remission from activity. He is a 50 year old male with angry looking eyes when he presented to us and all his signs of activity as we can see have reduced to no, um, nil after 8 months of treatment. The residual uh, retraction in the left eye was corrected after by surgery after the patient became inactive. Uh, clinical activity score at the start of treatment was 7.1 plus minus 1.1 standard deviation and drastically reduced to 1.2 plus minus 0.4 after the treatment. Coppin and Macklin had studied uh, thyroid eye disease uh, comparison while using oral prednisolone and IVMP. When compared to our study, despite the similar demographic profile in all the three groups, as we can see, 2.7 millimeter improvement was noted in our study in proptosis as compared to IVMP, only 0.8 and no improvement with oral prednisolone. In our study, 60% of the patients had improvement in diplopia, whereas as compared to IVMP, only 25% were in improved and a 5.9 point improvement in the clinical activity score was noted in our study when IVMP was used along with immunomodulation. Hence, IVMP with immunomodulation is more efficacious than oral steroids or IVMP alone. It has less systemic adverse effects. All the patients in our study had been monitored by complete blood counts and liver function tests. Initiation of treatment in the active phase uh, it, uh, sorry, initiation of treatment in the active phase positively affects the outcome and reverses the inflammatory effects of thyroid eye disease. 
Immunomodulators are just disease-modifying agents and they act as maintenance treatment to sustain the inactive state and prevent complication. A treatment duration of six months appears to be sufficient for maximum effectiveness. In conclusion, monitored IVMP pulse therapy with short-term immunomodulation is effective in improving cosmesis, achieving functional recovery, controlling the disease activity, and causing resolution of symptoms without any major side effects. These are my references. Thank you. Uh, can you take a question? What was the duration of the, the, the thyroid eye disease? Where were your success rates? Was there any analysis done on that? So the patients who presented in the active state, every patient that was present, that presented to us first was graded on the clinical activity score. So most of the patients who presented, they uh, had active disease since two to three months. And few of them also were given oral prednisolone and they did not improve. So most patients that presented with an active disease were uh, in the uh, duration of about four to five months when we started them on treatment. What caused the failures? Sorry, sir. Which patients failed to improve? Did you do that? Uh, so patients uh, who failed to improve were uh, the ones who had active disease who despite immunomodulation were not improving. And we tried to uh, give them immunomodulation for an extended period of about six to eight months as well. But they uh, kept on having recurrences once we stopped the IVMP. So patients in whom the uh, IVMP was stopped and they kept recurring, we, all, we had to give them an extended period of immunomodulation. Despite that, uh, about 11%... I understood that. Improve. What I'm asking is, what was it that uh, led to that failure? Have you been able to identify that? Yes, sir, we have. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Can I start? So, can I start? Yeah, please, please, please. Good afternoon. This paper is an analysis of a common clinical condition faced by oculoplasty surgeons on a day-to-day -day basis. The authors have no financial interest. Now, it's very distressing for both the patient and the surgeon to see implant exposure after a relatively straightforward procedure like evisceration with implant. Over the last several years, I've had to treat significant number of exposed implants. Now, these were other surgeons' patients. So the question that rose in my mind, were the implants responsible? I almost never used those particular materials of implants. And... Am I missing something? Are my surgeries having that same kind of exposure and going elsewhere? Conventionally, higher exposure risk is associated with large implants, scarred conjunctiva, infected ocular contents such as after endophthalmitis, porous implants, and poor surgical technique. And this comes to us from our teachers, colleagues who tell us, oh, such and such implant is rubbish. Conferences and gut feeling. When we look at the literature, however, they talk about implant exposure rates of 5 to 20 percent, and there's a whole bunch of outcome measures on newly minted implants from different manufacturers, but they don't talk about risk factors. Exposure risk in endophthalmitis has been described, but that also is 10 to 12 percent, which is the same as the other eyes. So instead of uh, exposure rates, we decided to analyze the risk factors. Group A were 32 eyes with implant exposure. Group B was historical controls with 61 eyes without implant exposure who were all operated between 2010 to 14. There were multiple surgeons starting from residents to general ophthalmologists to uh, trained oculoplasty surgeons. All the patients were analyzed for presence of a small scleral shell, so possible tight scleral closure in ophthysis by large implant diameter implant material, porous or non-porous, presence of infection, multiple pre-evisceration surgeries, and duration of follow-up. The analysis was planned, and the mean follow-up was 18 months in group A and 36 months in the control group. The implants used were spherical implants of silicone, indigenous porous polyethylene, hydroxyapatite, and aluminum oxide. The interval to implant exposure was a mean of 20 months. The follow-up control group was 36 months which means we had an adequate follow-up of the control group that the possible implant exposures would not have been missed. The implant exposures, more than half of them presented with pain or discharge or bleeding. 
When we looked at the average implant diameter, it was 19.06 in the exposed groups and 18.7 in the control groups. So the difference is not significant. Now comes the interesting part. When we started analyzing factors, porous versus non-porous, presence of pre-evisceration infection, multiple surgery, thysis bulbi, nothing was significant. And we analyzed further, because there were some anecdotal reports, the indigenous porous polythylene implant was also not responsible, and placement of a large implant, 20 mm implant in a thysical scleral shell was not significant. The limitation is that we could not analyze the impact of surgical technique or surgeon factor, because there was no uniformity. Now, while these results are negative, they lead us to some very interesting conclusions. The average interval to exposure is 20 months. So only very long-term analysis is valid for any implant outcome. More than 50% of the patients are symptomatic. Alertness will improve early detection of implant exposure. No particular implant material is responsible, so we don't need to be industry-driven. The surgeons can choose their own implants. Size is not significant, so we can aim towards adequate volume replacement with appropriate size and not undersize the implants. And placing an implant post-end ophthalmitis is acceptable, so we, don't, we avoid a secondary surgery of implant, ex, uh, a secondary implant. And based on this, we might hypothesize by elimination <coughs> that ventricular surgical technique would possibly be the key to reducing implant exposure. Thank you. So are you suggesting that only trained ophthalmic surgeons, oculoplastic surgeons should do this? Sir, evisceration is a very standard procedure. Anybody can be trained to do the surges, surgery meticulously. It doesn't have to be a trained oculoplastic surgeon. But all you're surgery leaving needs us, you're training. You're leaving us with the surgical technique as the issue. Yes, sir. That is the only issue which yes, is, that, is that's questionable. What is, that is Everything what is else you sorted out. out, right? Yes, sir. So, so, uh, sorry, sir. Okay, the standardization of procedure starts with very meticulous uh, uh, dissection of the conjunctiva. You do not injure the conjunctiva. Conjunctiva is precious, and then, yeah. So, thank you, sir. Thank you. Sharad is here. Sharad. Dr. Sharad is here, I think. And uh, Dr. Vani Shet. You should spend a few moments with him and tell him clearly what is the prognosis and the possibility of visual outcome after the surgery. Unfortunately, with macular holes, many times the surgeons tell them, I will try my best, but I cannot tell you exactly. So that leaves a big question mark in the patient's mind. So this forms the basis of my study that we owe a, our patients a scientific answer about the outcome of the surgery we propose to do. Anatomical closure of macular holes does not always result in visual improvement for the surgeon. And even vision loss can occur after the surgery. So if you see the international literature, hole closure rates reported between 80 to 92% visual success rate even less between 40 to 80 percent and actual visual loss documented between 8 to 26 percent of the cases. A meta-analysis of all the predictive factors used by SDOCT uh, was published in 2014 where around 65 articles were published and the conclusion of majority of the studies was that the minimum hole diameter that means that the smaller the hole the visual outcome is better. But practically what we see, this is a patient who has got a preoperative vision of 624 and after surgery he has become 6 by 60 in spite of the hole being 300 microns, which is a small macular hole. And we will be in a very difficult position to explain to the patient. So what we did is we intensively analyzed our own data of 45 patients of macular holes and 
what we realized that we need to segregate the issue of whole closure, that is anatomical success, and we should separate it from the visual improvement prediction. So what we identified is that the top five parameters which can predict the whole closure rates are different from the parameters on the OCT which can predict, uh, the, predict the visual outcome. So, and we also found that there was a, some whole non-closure and visual loss predictors, that is presence of pre-existing uh, macular pathology and absence of cystic edema. We did a regression analysis of our own data and what we uh, analyzed and found that the visual outcome with holes more than 400 was better than holes less than 400 microns, which is in contrast to the internationally accepted literature. So based on our analysis, we propose that you cannot use any single one parameter in isolation to predict visual success or anatomical success. We need to combine, combine many parameters and we will be more predictive of the outcome. So what we have done is, we have made a nomogram and this will give you separately the whole closure prediction rate, that is the anatomical success, as well as the visual success, to separate. So I have made a scoring system and this is available online. You need to uh, feed these parameters and we will give you the uh, possibility that this patient will improve vision. So if you get a score of more than three in the anatomical success, you will see that these patients have got a very high likelihood of getting an anatomical success. Whereas visual improvement predictors are different and a score of more than four out of six will a good visual outcome is expected. Importantly, this uh, nomogram also uh, uh, addresses the issue of vision loss after surgery. So we have to look into this issue also and we have to subtract the uh, visual loss score what the patient gets into the visual improvement prediction. So the issue is now, does this nomogram work? Does it work in all situations? And will it work irrespective of the surgical various techniques which are used for macular hole? So I will just give you some examples for small macular holes, for large macular holes, traumatic macular holes, and the very famous inverted ILM flap technique. Now we will revisit this case who has lost vision after surgery of 624 to 6 by 60. So when we apply our nomogram with scientific basis, you will know that this patient was never destined to give, get vision after surgery. She has collected a visual improvement score of one and a half points out of six. And a visual uh, uh, anatomy closure rate is also yes. So she has got a type uh, two closure and a vision loss after surgery. A similar small hole, which is of three theta eight microns, and it has got a visual improvement from three meters to six nine. So our nomogram will tell you that the visual improvement prediction using these parameters has got a very good chance of uh, the patient giving a uh, good visual success. And definitely anatomically he is having a 100% success. So this para uh, nomogram will give you the anatomical as well as the visual success criteria. Now another example of a small macular hole of less than 250 microns with a 6-9 vision, you will expect that I will do a surgery fast and patient will get back 6 by 6 vision. So if you apply this nomogram, you will see that the chances of visual improvement, even in this small hole, is very less by applying all the parameters taking into conjunction. And that's what has happened. This patient has maintained 6 by 9. Anatomically, it has closed. Now, this is another patient of 431 microns, and he has got an anatomical score of only 1 by 4 and a visual improvement score of 2 by 6. So in spite of the hole being not very large, you can see that uh, there is a scientific no, basis of product, no uh, predicting these outcomes. I'd like you to summarize. So in conclusion, what we have shown is that this nomogram will work irrespective of the hole size, the etiology of the holes, the surgical technique used because it has got a scientific basis. And it has got an online, uh, uh, all these things are available online and you can, uh, anybody can log on to the uh, website and get the results within two minutes. Thank Can you. you. Thank you. Uh, lovely idea. Can you take a question? Yes, sir. The examples that you mentioned, are they graded prospectively or you have made a retrospective analysis? If you go away, I won't mark. It is a prospective. We, we have designed this nomogram two years back yeah. and we have got the two years data. We, we have actually validated it yeah. and fine-tuned it. Yeah. And now just one month back, we have made it online. 
Okay, can you give us some more information about your data till now? How many cases you have done like this and what is the statistical study of your uh, prediction? We, we have uh, initially to prepare the nomogram, we studied uh, 45 cases of macular holes. And after preparing the nomogram, we have utilized it for more than 100 cases with various surgeons and validated with intersurgeon variation as well as our own data. And once we fine tuned it that, only then last month we have launched it on, uh, online. It would so have been interesting if you had mentioned that slide in your presentation. There has been a, a validation from others also. Yes. Yeah? Unfortunately, you didn't have time to bring yeah. that out. That is a very important That one part. slide would have made the presentation still... Thanks. Share it. Very good afternoon. I will be presenting my innovation, which is an attachment for holding the PWL or the 132 lens during retinal surgeries. As we all know, wide-angle viewing systems are indispensable. However, the con non-contact wide-angle viewing systems are costly. The contact wide-angle viewing systems are affordable, but you require a good assistant. So then I ventured out as they say, the necessity is mother of all inventions. I had very less money when I started my own center, and that time I ventured out and saw what are the options available. The PWL lens and the 132 diopter lens are the less commonly used non-contact viewing systems. However, they are attached to the headrest of the patient table, and they require frequent manipulations. Hence, these are not popular. So I went ahead and devised a way to attach this lens to the microscope. So the PWL lens, many of us would not know, is a lens which comes with an inbuilt prism and doesn't require any inverter. The 132 diopter lens requires an inverter. The attachment is similar except for the terminal part which holds both the lens, hence the term universal. There's a knob which can adjust the distance between the cornea and the lens. The more closer you go to the cornea, the larger the field of view you can get. So this is how it is attached. So it has got a simple swing in and swing out alignment. So you just place the lens into the lens holder, swing it in, your wide angle viewing system is ready for action. During the surgery, if you don't want it, you can just swing it out. The 132 diopter con non-contact lens requires the inverter, but it doesn't require the condensing lens as is usually used in the biome. This is the view with the PWL lens under fluid. This is the view under air. Coming to the 132 diopter lens, this is the view you can get with the 132 diopter lens. For comparison, I will just attach the contact wide angle here to the same system. And this is the field of view with the contact wide angle system. The contact wide angle gives the largest field of view and the views that you're seeing are comparable. A short surgical video. Just swing the lens in. If you don't want it, you can just swing it out. Then when you start the surgery, lower the lens to increase the field of view. Here one can use the foot switch of the microscope to focus. So this is very helpful to get a very fine focus. This is the view that you're getting with the PWL lens and the fluid. If you want to see the posterior pole, just zoom in and focus. This is the view with the 132 diopter lens, which almost looks like a biome lens, and this requires an inverter. Here I have attached the contact wide angle for the sake of comparison. This is the field of view that you're getting and the clarity during a fluid air exchange. This is another video. Place the lens and your wide angle is ready. 
This is the view that you are getting with the PWL lens. The peripheral vitrectomy. This is with, done with indentation. Here again, because you are able to use the microscope fine focus, here you can see now, I'll zoom it up. And still using the microscope fine focus, one can get a very good image resolution. The laser being done with the same system. And the view in a pseudo eye during fluid air exchange. Coming to the costing, the PWL lens costs around 1.3 to 1.5 lakhs. The 132 diopter lens costs somewhere around 40,000. With an inverter, depending on what you choose, it can be ranged from 1 lakh to 2.75 lakhs. And this universal attachment may cost around 70,000. And you can have a non-contact wide-angle viewing system with high-quality imported lenses at less than 2.5 lakhs. So the advantages of this system is it can be steam sterilized. You get a comparable field of view and ease of use. The use of the microscope fine focus for crisp imaging without requiring a condensing lens. And one can use it between multiple centers. Thus, it gives us a versatility of a non-contact imaging capability of a contact wide angle system. This can be a cost effective option. And this development process took me more than two years, five prototypes. The first one failed, then went on to make different prototypes. Finally ended up with this, hoping to improve it further so that it may help many VR colleagues. Thank you very much. The 132 diopter lens can be steam sterilized with the smaller lens. The other lens requires a ETU. The attachment is steam sterilized. The attachment is what I have developed. The PWL lens is available. Good afternoon. I'll be talking upon polyvalent choroidal vasculopathy and central serous choreoretinopathy, diseases of the same spectrum. TCV is a well known condition consisting of peculiar subretinal polyvalent vascular lesions associated with serous and hemorrhagic pigment epithelial detachment. CSR is characterized by idiopathic detachment of the neurosensory retina. There are reports showing association between these two. History of CAC is shown to be more common in cases with TCV and cases with TCV are also associated with changes of chronic CAC. Recently, they have been grouped together in pachycoroid disease spectrum. To this effect, we studied the multimodal imaging features in cases of suspected TCV, looking for simultaneous presence of CSR. It was a retrospective case series where the imaging and clinical data of 181 cases of suspected TCV were analyzed. The relevant history, best corrected visual acuity, clinical features along with OCT, SFA and ICG features were noted. Five eyes of five patients were identified where simultaneous presence of both TCV as well as CSC was noted. The mean age was 63.2 years, three were male and two were female. The first case was of a 52-year-old female who presented with defective vision in right eye for six months. The OCT showed a notched PED with a polyp beneath the RPE and a serous macular detachment. The subfovial cor uh, corridor thickness was 406 micrometers. FFA showed a smokestack leak superonasal to the fovea, whereas ICG showed polyps inferior to the fovea at a separate location. On revisiting the OCT, a micro rip in the RPE could be identified at the area corresponding to the smokestack leak. Second case is of a 72-year-old male who had defective vision for two months in the left eye. OCT again showed irregular peak PEDs with subretinal fluid overlying a thickened choroid of 464 microns. There was an inkblot leak superotemporal to the fovea and ICG showed polyps subfovially. Third case is a 65-year-old male who was already treated as a left eye query PCV or CNVM. 
On OCT, there were multiple irregular PEDs along with subretinal fluid and subretinal heme. SFA showed a smokestack leak inferotemporal to the fovea and ICG showed separate uh, subfovial polyps at a separate location. OCT also identified a micro rip in the area corresponding to the smokestack leak. Fourth case was of a 64-year-old male with defective vision in left eye for 14 days. His OCT of the left eye showed an irregular pigment epithelial detachment along with subretinal fluid. SFA showed an ink blot leak inferonasal to the fovea along with some stippled hyperfluorescence superior to the fovea which corresponded to polyps on ICG. Fifth case is a 62-year-old female who had defective vision in both eyes for six months. In the left eye of this patient, OCT showed an irregular undulated RPE subfovially, but nasal to the disc was a large PED with subretinal fluid. On FFA, there was a smokestack leak nasal to the disc and superior to the disc, we could identify polyps on ICG. Again, a micro rip could be identified in the area corresponding to the smokestack leak. The sublesional uh, coronal thickness here as well was 423 microns. So, on OCT, we could identify irregular PEDs in four cases, notched or peaked in two cases, subretinal fluid in all cases with heme in three and exudates in one. The subfovial coronal thickness mean was 371.2 microns and all these patients had dilated outer coronal vessels. On FFA, ink blot leak was identified in two cases and smokestack in three. ICG identified macular polyps in two cases and extramacular in three cases. Coming to discussion, both of the pathogenesis of both these conditions is not very clear, but there is an increasing role of choroidal congestion and hyperpermeability in both these cases. Pachychoroid has been defined as an abnormal increase in choroidal thickness associated with enlarged outer choroidal vessels and the attenuation of the choriocapillaries and the saclar layer. The spectrum of these diseases include pachychoroid pigment epitheliopathy, which is just non-specific RPE changes without SRF, as well as pachychoroid neovasculopathy, which is type 1 neovascularization overlying areas of choroidal thickening other than PCV and CSR. These diseases can be easily linked in the, a spectrum of diseases as if in a hyperpermeable thick choroid, the RPE is able to overcome the fluid overload, we just see some subtle pigmentary changes or PPE. If not, a serious macular detachment can result leading into a CSR. In both these conditions, there will be a stress on RPE, which can lead to micro rips in the Brooks membrane as well. If these are associated with a type 1 neovascularization, we can see a uh, pachychoroid neovasculopathy. A pachychoroid neovasculopathy or a hyperpermeable choroid, both can lead to terminal vessel dilatation or polyps leading to a PCV. The limitations of this study were the retrospective nature and the follow-up are not included in this particular study. Hence, to conclude, here, for the first time, we are able to demonstrate two separate disease manifestations at separate location in the same eye simultaneously. This gives a direct evidence to the hypothesis that CSR and PCV belong to a same spectrum of diseases overlying a thickened choroid. These are my references. Thank you. One is the demonstration. The clinical significance is here we are seeing a CSR leak. On an FFA, we can identify a leak. But treating that is not going to treat the condition overall. The important thing is in unresolving cases, we need to ima uh, image them further and identify if there is a coexisting morbidity as well. When PC these all the cases needed uh, treatment in form of PC uh, treatment for PC with injections and then PDT once the PED and everything resolved. The second uh, important thing was that uh, wherever we are suspecting an unresolving CSR, that also requires a further investigation. Because just on an FFA or CSR leak, uh, it might be misleading. They are all belonging to the same spectrum of diseases. So in future, we can have a prognostic, I mean, we can identify that this, this condition may progress in some cases and may not. So CSR investigation protocol. Yes. That's what you're leading to. Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be talking. I'll be talking on outcomes of a management strategy in eyes with corneal irregularity and cataract. We have no financial disclosures to make. Usually these days we come across a lot of cataract patients who have undergone refractive surgeries in the past. 
when there was a not, uh, there was no actual set protocol or a Randleman's criteria that we follow these days. So with these patients, the only fear that a cataract surgeon has, if it's a decentered ablation or if it is an irregular anterior surface, how is the post-operative outcome going to be? Is the patient going to be happy with a perfect vision or the corneal abrasions are going to hamper his vision? So as we know that the corneal abrasions uh, and the lenticular abrasions sum up to the total uh, abrasions. So even if we do a cataract surgery and make sure that the IOL component is taken care of, even then the patient is still going to not be very happy with his vision because the corneal part of the eye is not being corrected. So if we do a cataract surgery without regularizing the cornea, then postoperatively just the internal optics of the individual will be corrected, not the, uh, the corneal part. So hence the uh, total aberration is still going to be persistent and the patient is going to be unhappy eventually. So the research question that we asked is, when we know that the patient has undergone a refractive procedure, if there is a decentered ablation or if there is a centered island, can we do a cataract surgery or should we do treat the irregularity of the eye first and then do the cataract surgery? So we had a female patient, a 45-year-old patient, who had undergone a refractive procedure in the past and she presented to us with cataract. So when we did a topography, we saw that there were central islands. So we did, uh, it's not playing over there, sir, but it's coming here, I don't know why. So when we did a topolyzer, a topolyzer is an Allegretto wave light topolyzer, which takes around uh, eight readings. It decides the asphericity of the eye, it targets it, and it takes around readings. So when we put that on the TCAT software, and then we predict the ablation profile of the eye, and when the customization was done, post customization, we saw that the cornea was fairly aspheric, so the central islands had disappeared. So now we, uh, the same individual, if we see on a ray trace aberrometry, the internal optics are there because of the cataract, but again the corneal uh, uh, aberrations are more because the cornea is uh, relatively has the islands over there. So post-treatment, after doing the topo-guided treatment, we found that these irregularities in the cornea disappeared. The internal optics were uh, untouched as we had not yet done the cataract surgery. So after doing the cataract surgery on uh, Snellens, the patient had a perfect vision. So there have been various studies previously which say that you can do a customized pattern ablation if at all patient has an irregular astigmatism post-refractive surgery. But how can we apply it as a cataract surgeon? So if we can do a topo-guided treatment before cataract surgery, then maybe we could predict our IOL power and we could be more accurate in what we are doing. So the aim of a study was to evaluate the outcomes of a management strategy in patients with irregular corneas and cataract. So this was a prospective interventional case series. So we selected patients who had undergone LASIK procedures with uh, symptomatic cataract and we had made sure the minimal pachymetry was 400 microns. So we excluded patients with uh, systemic diseases, collagen vascular diseases, or even uh, keratoconus suspect or even ectasias. So all the patients who came to us for the procedure, we did a topography on them to see the regularity or the irregularity in the cornea. Then a topolyzer was done to get the ablation profile and what exactly had to be treated and to make the cornea more aspheric. The topo-guided corneal regularization was done in these individuals. We waited for around six weeks post uh, the topo-guided treatment, and then we performed the cataract surgery on these patients. So coming to how we did the uh, topo-guided treatment, we did not change the refraction in these individuals. We just changed the Q value. That is, we wanted to make the cornea more aspheric. So we only changed the Q value in these patients, and also the C4 and C12. That is the spherical abrasion and defocus. So only that we changed, and accordingly, we did the topo-guided treatment, and we got a fairly good result. So post-operatively, since we don't have a particular outcome as to how much time we would have to wait, we waited uh, for around one and a half months, and we did three readings of keratometry. So we, when we found that there was not around 0.2 diopters difference, only then we went ahead uh, hoping that the cornea would be stabilized by now. So then uh, the IOL power was calculated using an online ASCRS calculator. So if you see in this individual, preoperatively, the broad histogram, that is quite, it is quite irregular. And after the ablation, it was more regular uh, according to the EKR map. 
So the results, we had six eyes, three right and three left of four patients. Mean age was around 45 years. The duration was LASIK was around eight to 10 years after the procedure. And TCAD after TCAD, we waited uh, for around one and a half months. SPSS version 17 was used for statistical analysis. So in our uh, study, we found that there was less than 0.5 diopter difference uh, in these individuals over a period of year. We uh, followed them for a year and we saw that there was less than 0.5 diopter difference. It was quite efficacious and astigmatism also had decreased in these individuals. So we found that 1.3 difference in IOL power calculation with keratomatic values pre and post surface regularization was seen. So if at all we had done the cataract surgery without regularizing the cornea, then probably after the surgery, we would have a refractive surprise of around 1.3 diopters approximately. It could be more or less rather. So we concluded saying the surface regularization uh, of irregular cornea before cataract surgery, it ensures more predictable IOL power calculation and reduces the chances of refractive surprise. So our strategy of treating the cornea by TCAT first followed is safe and it is most effective. So the limitation was that it was a smaller sample size. We did not have a control group. But uh, since the numbers are going to increase, uh, more baby boomers coming up with cataract. So we want to use this as a peer review to expand our study. And if this strategy works, then probably all patients with irregular astigmatism can undergo a topoguided treatment and then go ahead with surgery. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, can, I ask, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, what was the of selection of your cases? Because somebody, you suggested something like a decentered ablation. Yes, sir. And somebody who with a decentered ablation wouldn't remain asymptomatic for such a long period. So no. what was the basis uh, for selection? No, so, so usually what happens, these patients had undergone the procedure around 15, 20 years ago. The ablation, they probably had the astigmatism or underlying uh, thing, but they were not treated anywhere else. So now that they have developed cataract, they thought the de reason for their decreased vision is because of cataract. So that's how they had come to us for the treatment of cataract. So when we did a topo guided treatment and when we saw that we realized that it was because of the corneal problem that they were having decreased vision and not entirely because of the cataract alone. So once we treated that, then we found. What is the data that you have to project about this 1.3 diopter difference? Did you do this uh, IOL calculation before the treatment and yes, after sir. the yes. treatment? Yes, we have done the IOL calculation before the treatment and after, after the treatment as well. And we've been following up these patients regularly also to see if the cornea is still stabilizing or is there any change. So far, we've just got around 0.25% variation in these individuals. Thank you, sir. on a hybrid optic, new design, multifocal intraocular lens, the initial results. The authors have no financial interest in the matter produced herein. So press biopic correction, sans spectacles, still remains the holy grail post-cataract surgery. A number of attempts have been made for spectacle independent vision post-cataract in the form of either monovision or multifocal IOLs, whether it's refractive or diffractive and accommodative lenses. But the main side effect of these multifocal IOLs has been photic phenomena in the form of glare and halos. So my purpose was to evaluate the distant and near visual outcomes along with photic phenomena of a hybrid optic multifocal IOL. It was a prospective non-randomized clinical case series which included around 40 eyes of 36 patients done over a year from February 2015 to Jan 2016. Preoperatively, routine assessment was done including the distance and near visual acuity along with a biometry and routine evaluation. Postoperatively, distance and near visual acuity, both uncorrected and corrected, were measured at one week, one month, six months, and ten months later. We also evaluated for spectacle independence and patient satisfaction. The exclusion criteria was ocular comorbidity in the form of any retinopathy or retinal degeneration, any corneal surgery done. A keratometric cylinder, more than one diopter patients were excluded. Senile myotic pupils, traumatic midriasis or iris coloboma was excluded. The IOL design is a single piece hydrophobic acrylic foldable 13 mm lens with a 6 mm optic. It has a symmetric biconvex design with an anterior aspheric profile. This lens is dependent on pupil size. The uniqueness of this lens lies in the fact that it has a refractive optic with a central small DOE, that is a diffractive optic element, which is of plus 3.5 diopters add, 
which would translate to around a 2.5 at the spectacle plane. This IOL utilizes the principle of refraction and diffraction, aptly called a hybrid IOL. So to explain to you all, it is a pupil dependent IOL. In ambient light conditions when the pupil is around 4 mm, 90% of the light is focused for distance and only 9% is focused for near. In dim light conditions when the pupil is 5 mm, 95% goes for distance and a meager 5% passes through the central DOE, hence preserving contrast sensitivity, minimizing the incidence of all photic phenomena like glare, halos and ghosting. Unlike the diffractive IOLs which have intolerable glare and halos. In, uh, when there is near vision, that there, when there is near vision associated meiosis, the amount of energy going through the central DOE is almost 40% resulting in optimum near vision. So the results, we had a mean follow-up of eight months and the mean patient age was 55 years. Four patients had bilateral implantation of this lens. These are the anterior segment photographs post-implantation, both undilated and dilated state. The distance visual acuity outcomes were extremely gratifying and all 40 eyes had a 0, 0.0 logmar BCBA. The UCBA of 36 eyes was 0.2 or better and the remaining four eyes was 0.3. And the mean UCBA for distance was 0 0.145 logmar. The mean BCBA for distance was 0, 0.0. The near visual outcome uh, outcomes were also extremely encouraging and all 40 eyes had BCBA for near vision with distance correction N6. We had a self-made questionnaire inquiring for the incidence of glare, halos, difficulty in night driving and satisfaction. One patient complained of difficulty of driving at night, hence patient satisfaction was around 100% and all of them said that they would either put it in their other eye or even suggest it to their relatives and friends. 36% patients achieved spectacle independence in the operated eye and all four patients who had bilateral implantation were spectacle free. So this is the hybrid optic, uh, hybrid IOL light distribution curve that you see. As the pupil size increases, more and more amount of light energy goes for distance and at 2 mm pupil, ideal for reading, 40% is through the central DOE ensuring good near vision. The advantages of this hybrid optic IOL is one, clear distance vision. Secondly, no halos around light. Because there are no ring segments in this optic, for refraction or diffraction and the embedded near segment reflects a minimal quanta of energy, hence there is hardly any halos. Secondly, it only has a single transition zone between the refractive optic and the central DOE. This again reduces the, con uh, reduces the incidence of scattering and diffraction of light rays, hence preserving contrast sensitivity and minimizing the incidence of glare. Third, fourthly, it gives acceptable near vision as well. The limitations were we needed a larger sample size and there wasn't any control group. Thank you for your kind attention. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you made that confession because I was going to ask you one year in India, 40 cases? So this IOL, sir. This particular IOL, sir. Yeah, uh, don't you think it was... Sir, one year is the follow-up, sir. No, uh, the period year... for the study was February to Jan. Yes, sir. So that makes it what? So this IOL was only implanted in uh, 40 case. eyes in this, yes sir. In this time period, that's what I'm saying. Yes sir, yes sir. For this IOL, sir, since it is a new design IOL, we needed to ensure that the patient follow-up would be appropriate. The patient uh, would be willing for a multifocal IOL because a multifocal IOL, everybody is not yet willing. They have to be totally convinced to get a uh, multifocal IOL implanted before we actually do the surgery. So that is why we have you, only You've not uh, alluded to any pre-op uh, topographic and astigmatic data, etc. Uh, sir, we excluded patients having astigmatism more than one diopters because post multifocal eye implantation, that is one of the major reasons of dissatisfaction in these patients, sir. So we excluded them. And uh, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Respected chairperson and dear friends, Femtosecond laser-assisted cataract surgery has been claimed by the industry as a breakthrough in the field of cataract surgery. But it is imperative on the ophthalmologist to decide whether it is a superior or inferior procedure as compared to conventional phaco emulsification. I will be presenting a randomized comparison between both the methods. Authors have no financial disclosure. We compared post-operative visual outcomes at four weeks Specular microscopic endothelial counts at four weeks and whether it translated into any significant difference in the pachymetry values, mean absolute error, irrigating fluid consumption, incidence of complications and wound integrity. 
We also compared change in the anterior chamber depth post-operatively in the back parameters, that is circularity of capsular excess, capsular overlap and decentration of IOL and effective FACO time. Ours was a prospective case control comparative study and these were the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Both the groups consisted of 55 eyes of 55 patients and the control group matched with the study group for nucleus hardness as per LOCS3 classification. Surgeries of both the groups were done by the same surgeon. Four weeks after cataract surgery, digital retroillumination photographs were imported with dilated pupils into Adobe Photoshop and circularity, capsular overlap and decentration of IOL was measured using Adobe Photoshop software. Both the groups had similar demographics. Uncorrected visual equity at four weeks showed no significant difference between the groups. However, best corrected visual equity was better in the femtosecond group and the statistical result was marginally significant. Comparison of endothelial cell density showed that although there was a post-operative decrease in the cell for both the groups, the cell loss in the femtosecond group was marginally more significant as compared to the control group. P-value was around 0 0.032 and cell loss in the femto group was 4.2% more as compared to the control group. However, it did not translate it into any significant difference in the pachymetry values. Residual refractive error was analyzed using the mean absolute error, which is the difference between the predicted and the achieved spherical equivalent refraction. And in our study, there was no significant difference in the mean absolute error for both the groups. There was no difference in the irrigating fluid consumption. Incidence of complications was independent of the method of surgery. No wound leak was found in any of our patients. The change in the anterior chamber depth may be considered a surrogate for lens positioning. And in our study, there was no significant difference in the anterior chamber depth post-operatively, inferring that the lens positioning was similar in both the groups. Circularity of capsular excess was measured using the Adobe Photoshop software, and a value closer to one indicates superior circularity. In our study, femtosecond group had a superior circularity, and the p-value was quite significant. It was zero. Capsular overlap is measured as the ratio of the shortest and the longest distance between edge of the capsular excess and edge of the IOL and a value closer to one indicates superior capsular overlap. In our study, femto group had a superior capsular overlap. P-value was zero. Decentration is measured as the distance from the center of the pupil to the center of the IOL optic. And in our study, decentration was lesser in the femtosecond group. P-value was around 0 0.002. Effective FACO time was analyzed by dividing the sample size into three cataract groups as per the nuclear opalescence and color of LOCS3 classification. And we saw that femtosecond group utilizes less effective FACO time for similar grade of nucleus sclerotic cataract as compared to conventional FACO. P-value was zero. Hence, we saw that in femtosecond surgery, best corrected visual equity was marginally better, although the difference was not very high. Study by Bell et al. have shown that mean post-operative best corrected equity was slightly better in the laser cataract group. Circularity, capsular overlap, and centration of IL was definitely superior in femtosecond cataract surgery, and study by Fredman et al. have also shown the same result. Femtosecond cataract surgery utilizes less effective FACO time as compared to conventional FACO, and it has been proven in literature as well. The loss in the endothelial cells in femtosecond group may be accounted for more centrally placed corneal incisions and the cell loss due to irrigation of the turbulent fluid. Also, the laser pretreatment may account for intraoperative meiosis, and use of intracameral adrenaline in such patients may account for the cell loss limitations of our study, we have not analyzed fidelity of the corneal incisions as a parameter. That is, number of times the corneal incision failed to open or was placed in a position not intended. And it is an aspect which we need to improve in femtosecond cataract surgery. Also, we have not done cost-effective analysis of femtosecond laser pretreatment. Hence, I will conclude by saying that in femtosecond cataract surgery, best corrected visual equity is marginally better Circularity, capsular overlap, and centration of IOL is definitely superior. Effective FACO time utilized is less. But what difference this increase in the best corrected equity makes to the quality of life of the patient and whether it justifies the extra expense associated with femtosecond cataract surgery needs to be studied further. Thank you.
<clears throat> when you started your study, didn't you know that these were factors? What factors? The last slide. Go to the last slide. We were not knowing, sir. When the we... difference in the increase in BCVA makes to the quality of life of the victim. Okay? Yes, sir. Or the patient, rather, not the victim. And justifies the extra expense associated. We no, were not didn't knowing. Did you know this? We before. were not knowing that, sir, because uh, we did the study because we know that phaco emulsification has evolved as a procedure for cataract surgery. But uh, when we did the surgery, we came to know that uh, the primary outcome variables were almost not having great significant difference as compared to the secondary outcome variables. And uh, when it comes to circularity, capsular overlap and centration, we found that femtosecond was better. So, but what difference? We have not done the cost-effective analysis of this femtosecond treatment. That's exactly the point I'm making is yes, sir. why have you not done the cost-effective analysis? Because the cost difference is massive. Correct, sir. So? We have not done in this study, sir. Per logmar gained, how much more have you spent? We have not analyzed that, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. His papers were quite excellent. In fact, it was a difficult job for us. We had to give a patient listening to, and there's very little to separate between the papers. That is as expected because this is a semi-final session. All the papers are best of their sessions, and now we have to select one of the best of the paper sessions, so it becomes a really difficult job. Segment by segment, we have to apply our mind, and I wish all the contestants, or I, right now, now I am using the word contestant. Till now, Maniar was requesting you to enjoy the session, but now the contest comes into play. Hope the best paper wins. The results will are tabulated and will be given to the scientific committee, and you have to get in touch with the scientific committee to know the outcome. Okay. Uh, it's really very pleasant to note that the most of the presenters have been very, very young. Uh, ophthalmologist and it's a very nice trend to observe. We hope this trend continues because you are the future of ophthalmology in India. Thank you very much for excellent presentations. I really, can only echo your thoughts. Really happy that some innovation you had taken to the industry and conclude up to the production. So that is what has really impressed me. Thank you. What really hurt was some of the speakers themselves had to leave. As it is, there was no crowd. But even if the speakers left, it makes it even worse. I think they spoke last. That's why they're there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we'll send this.